Hello everyone and welcome back to the ArmorCast channel. My name is Joshua, also known as Koala, and today we're not so much discussing tanks, but what's under them. Tracks. Tracks are one of two defining features that make something a tank, the other being that it is a combat vehicle. No, a bulldozer is not a tank. Tracks are used to give these behemoths the traction they need to move, and the strength to do it over all kinds of ground while weighing 60 to 70 tons plus. So when even these beasts get stuck in the mud, it can prove a great problem to get them out again. This is why you see logs attached to the sides of Soviet tanks, and from the days of the 1930s right through to the modern day, these logs were a cheap and simple, rudimentary way to unstuck even the heaviest of fighting vehicles. Tanks. Heavy, powerful, even beautiful. Expected to handle all the punishment that could be thrown at them and dish it back in return, and tackle the harshest of terrain. To be able to move while carrying all that armour, tanks rely on the flat base provided by tracks, which spreads out the weight of the vehicle across its whole length easily when compared to wheels. A wheel only provides roughly a handprint sized contact with the ground, and putting all that weight on such a comparably small and uneven surface area makes the vehicle highly susceptible to bogging in poor terrain, or breaking down thanks to damaging the drivetrain. Tracks provide even pressure over a much wider area, and their mostly metal construction offers a large amount of friction, allowing for more stable driving over rough terrain, the ability to easily cross trenches, and the purchase needed to prevent tanks from getting bogged down in soft, muddy soil. Sometimes, however, this isn't enough. The Soviet Union especially faced this problem during World War II, where tanks frequently ended up stuck in the damp, boggy earth, or trapped in ditches in the uneven fields covered in the craters from German artillery. The cheapest and easiest way to reverse such a problem is to simply widen the area on which the tank's weight is being balanced, which is why German tanks travelling north during Operation Barbarossa received upgrades for their tracks, widening them to better handle the winter soil. This is also where our logs come in. Although proving somewhat useful as additional armour protection, the main reason for the logs strapped to the sides of Soviet tanks is for them to be laid out under the tracks to give extra purchase for unditching, and the exact same technique works to get cars out of sand or snow. Typically only stored on one side or the rear of the tank, the crew can quickly move the log out in front of the vehicle, at which point it will drive forward onto the log and use the extra surface area to push out of the mud. While other nations such as America faced this problem far more rarely and therefore could afford to rely on armoured recovery vehicles to help tow tanks if they became stuck, the Russian terrain and climate makes this problem a common occurrence for tanks and so having the means to unstuck the vehicle quickly and without help, and get nice and muddy in the process, was extremely important. After all, what if the recovery vehicle gets stuck too? The process definitely isn't limited to Russian tanks, and was frequently used by World War I tanks of various nations to help cross the churned up dirt of no man's land. Logs were also used for armour, more commonly by German or American tanks, although this proved mostly ineffective, especially against kinetic energy, armour piercing rounds. I've seen previous discussions on this topic asking why the practice died out, and the answer is, it didn't. Not only were logs applied to all tanks from the T-34 through to this T-80U or even T-90, but can even be seen on this T-80 BVM, which has only entered service in the last two years. While more numerous and advanced armoured recovery vehicles have rendered bogging less of an issue and are the typical way to go about unditching tanks that may become stuck, the practice of using logs has become a tradition that almost all Russian Federation tanks have kept up, although you won't see such makeshift, rudimentary practices on the state-of-the-art Armata series. Well lads, that is it for today, bit of a short video on a simple topic I know, but one I see thousands of questions about, and so I wanted to make this video for anyone to share in response to those questions when they pop up. If you enjoyed this video, I would hugely appreciate you leaving a like to help the algorithm, and if you want to support this channel, then check us out on Patreon. If you'd like to enter the giveaway for one of these framed main battle tank posters, then all you have to do is subscribe to this channel, turn notifications on, and leave a comment down below. Until next time, thanks for watching, stay safe, and I'll catch you on the battlefield. The A7 Corsair was a successor to the earlier A4 Skyhawk in every way, and was one of the most advanced aircraft in the world for its time, being equipped with a heads-up display, very rare for the 1960s. First designed in the early 60s by Vought, now a part of LTV, the aircraft was based on the F-8 Crusader, the US Navy's primary fighter aircraft in the Vietnam War. 